yeah, two week project, six month project, whatever. Mean time, what's time on a geologic scale? Come along on my creative journey in designing and fashioning a new Florentine Renaissance gown known as a Gamora. Accompany me through all of the sometimes frustrating stages, from conception and patterning through to construction and finishing. There will be plenty of lessons learned and cheeky commentary along the way. On our last enchanting episode, we put needle to fabric and started sewing the bodice and sleeves after considering how exactly we wanted to construct the garment. We also explored some interesting documentary evidence for this new gown, as well as captivating cultural differences across various polities in Italy. We are now on the road again, this time freshly arrived in Florence. The bodice has been completely sewn together with the interior seams turned and finished, so we are pushing ahead with, well, everything else which I intend to accomplish largely here in Florence. But as in all wars of creativity, my plan does not long survive contact with the enemy. That being in this case, other projects, my new Burgundian silk velvet hood and silk damask belt specifically. When I next take the time to sit and sew on this project, I find myself on a visit to medieval Pistoia in full 15th century attire, where I work on sleeve lacing holes while we wait for lunch to be served in this gorgeous historic city. Over the next two months of travel, I do find time to continue working on the various pieces of this gown, but somehow never managed to really record while I was doing so. So we shall explore the details of all this in a bit via several dramatic recreations, but first, a progress report. Well, here we are back in Korea. The um, two-week project has become almost a six-month project. It's now early February. Let's cut up to speed, shall we? The bodice is nearly done. I have attached almost all of the lacing rings, which are a reproduction of lace in archaeological find. Plus, uh, there's lots of visual evidence of these in various portraits, actual portraits, not, you know, allegorical. Basically, I ended up settling on, well, not basically, I did end up settling on spiral lacing in the front. Once I finish the final lacing ring on that, which I attached using um, a sort of buttonhole stitch around the the rings of the rings and once we do that then i guess i'm going to have to actually seriously ponder the finishing of all of these edges so here's the deal everyone on osana's gamora basically this is just turned up and then after the skirt is attached it's finished with this band that goes all the way around but my wool is very feisty um, and it has created this really because I, I rolled it under to make sure that those edges were all nice and clean and I really did want that soft boning effect right um, but because I did that it's now a bit like there's boning that goes all the way to the bottom here so I'm either gonna have to trim away the bottom part of the rolled hem or the rolled seam or I'm gonna to have to come up with another finishing technique for the bottom because just if I fold this in half now at the three points, four, five points, because it's also then here in the front, you end up with these really thick, thick points that are going to kind of press into my waist um, ahead of the rest of the bodice. And especially it's, it's going to create extra bulk around my waistline, which I don't really want. So I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is that I'm going to bind the bottom here also in a, the matching wool and then I'm going to whip stitch the, pleat, the pleated skirts into that bottom bound edge. Now I have no evidence for the 15th century that this was done. I have no visual evidence of it and Osana's Gamora is not that way at all but that may have to be the solution I'm going to have to come up with for this particular bodice just because of the nature of yeah the the way the seams have turned out how thick they are and how heavy they are and I definitely don't want that thickness doubling up so basically the entire thing is going to be bound and then I will attach the skirts because the last thing I want to be doing is attach the skirts and then fiddle with the binding around all of these openings. So first we bind and finish up all of the various openings and then we will attach the skirts. Sleeves. Uh, the sleeves. I ended up settling on a sleeve and it's inside out so you can see the contrast a little bit better. I ended up settling on uh, attaching, completely closing, this upper part, at least for now, of the sleeve, the upper half of the sleeve. And then for the lower one, I actually went with spiral lacing all halfway up the sleeve. 
And then next I'm going to whip stitch this together so that you end up with this little space here through which snowy white linen will poof alluringly. We all know I like to have my snowy white linen. Hopefully it will be snowy and white. Oh, uh, probably not considering what I do to clothes. <clears throat> it'll probably be more like grimy and sweat covered. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we did spiral lacing and there was definitely a remembrance curve. It's apparently been a while since I've um, done lacing holes, I guess. And you can definitely see a difference in the ones that I started with and the ones I ended with. <laughs> uh, well, right. So that is where the sleeves are. Now, the nice thing about the whip stitching that I've done here is that if I decide, and I probably will later, that I want more openings along the upper part of the sleeve for alluring puffs of white, then I can just cut out the whip stitching and do other things. Cheeky self-promotion time. If you are enjoying this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe and the notification bell if you want to know when I launch new things. And if you want to do more to support my work, then consider the super thanks button on YouTube or maybe becoming a patron on Patreon, which comes with a whole host of perks and extras like access to premium tutorials, multiple hour ones in fact, and discounts on classes. And now back to your regularly scheduled Contessa. Since we just discussed the sleeves, let us look at creating and finishing the lacing holes. Unfortunately, the extensive footage I captured of this part of the process was, um, well, generally useless from a visual perspective. It literally made me queasy to watch. I don't know what I was thinking when I set up the camera. Anyway, I will be rolling that out as a separate thing for people who just want to listen to me talk while I sew and maybe get something useful at some point. But for the purposes of visually demonstrating how I created the hole on these sleeves, here is a dramatic recreation. So first off, we take this handy dandy awl, which is actually part of my medieval eating kit. First, we use the awl to poke a hole in the fabric. Remember, never use a hole punch. This will remove precious fabric from your garment and create a weak spot that will tear out under pressure. By using the awl, we are actually pushing the fibers aside and creating a dense ring of material that will act like a fabric grommet. Next, we anchor our thread. I'm using doubled thread here because this is a high traffic zone, lots of um, in and out through this orifice. So I just go through and catch the knot at the end, anchoring the knot on the backside. We then use a whip stitch to secure the hole open, occasionally re-awling the hole and using those first several stitches to catch the tail of the thread. This secures it very nicely. As you work around the hole, make certain that you are catching all the layers of fabric in the stitch, because your fabrics are likely to try and misbehave in rebellion to your active sartorial control. Well, that's hideous, but that's okay. <laughs> For the purposes of demonstration, it's fine, and it's not going to matter because we're about to cover this up. For the buttonhole stitch, we come up from underneath, just to the outside of the whip stitches, and then go down directly next to that first stitch, creating a horseshoe. I'm going to basically go through this loop from the outside of the circle straight into the center of the circle. And that basically kind of catches this and causes it to twist and create a little knot that then gets seated. And then I'm going to pull that knot that it's going to create towards the center. If you put it, if you pull it back this way and put it around the edge, you'll open your hole up and make it bigger, which I guess if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But I really want that ridge that this is going to create, this buttonhole stitch is going to create. I want that ridge in the center of the hole acting like a fabric grommet, basically. And there it is. Definitely not the best work I've ever done. And I should have washed my hands before working with white thread, but it is a completed lace hole akin to the ones fastening this Gamora's sleeve. Close up here. And now we're going to finish up the other sleeve, front of the other sleeve by just doing a set of whip stitches to make a little connector here. Well, while we sew this relatively humble garment made of modest republic approved wool, let us chat about its more um, sumptuous kin. In Florence, at any rate, gamore were the simpler version of the base gown, with cote representing the ostentatious option in the inventories. Starting at the end of the 13th century, Florence started attempting to control the rising ostentation, along with expenditures upon luxury items through a series of statutes referred to now as sumptuary laws sumptus being the Latin word for expense or cost. The irony here, of course, 
is that Florence's economy came to be based on those same luxury goods whose purchase the government was hoping to restrain. Perhaps it was a bunch of elder statesmen who implemented these rules, the sort who believed that the youth were dissolute and would ruin the world with their so-called irresponsible fashions. Perhaps the government was hoping for an export economy rather than domestic sales. You know, making money off of the moral dissolution of other polities. So I finish off my whip stitch by doing a couple of stitches around the bottom. Then I create a knot around those bottom stitches. And then I bury my needle in the interstices of the sleeve. And when you turn the sleeve right side out, the whip stitches are not visible at all, but instead you have a nice flat seam. Okay, well, time to, as promised, lace up the bodice and see what's what. I can already feel it's a little tight in the arm, so I uh, foresee some adjustments in our future. While we futz with the lacing, let us return to the topic of the fashion police. Interestingly, the preponderance of sartorial restrictions in the northern Italian city-states focused on constraining excesses of women's fashions rather than men's. Although... Florence did pass statutes in the early 15th century against men donning overly feminine attire. When the first laws limiting fashion excesses were passed in the late 13th century, the commune required law-breaking garments that had been made before the law to be tagged with a lead seal, apparently in the hope that this would drive the owners to have new, sartorially compliant garments made. Other city-states, such as Siena and Bologna, also instituted their own sets of sumptuary legislation. But of course, the fines were really just the cost of participation. Wealthy families simply paid the fine, got a lead seal on their garments proving they had paid the fine, and went on about their day. And of course, such statutes had, as to be expected, the opposite effect on society, driving people to want more ostentatious rather than less and prompting them to find new creative ways to, shall we say, detour around the statutes. Dorian Giovanni Villani writes in the 14th century that, in spite of all these strong ordinances, outrages remained, and though one could not have cut and figured cloth, they wanted striped cloth and foreign cloth, the most that they could have, sending as far as Flanders and Brabant for it, not worrying about the cost. You may be surprised to hear, dear viewer, that the enforcement of such laws was not only challenging, but, uh, shall we say, selective. For instance, during Florentine communal events, such as the Feast of San Giovanni, some puree restrictions were ignored by officials and families alike in order that the state might be glorified by the collective finery on display. Okay, well, um, otherwise it fits really well, I have to say. I am very happy with the how flatly everything lays, how flattering it is on my figure since this is a newly new pattern, so it all works out. Now you might notice there's a little bit of give here in the back, that's okay. Once we attach the sleeves and they go on my back, that will pull that flat outward like that. A fitting tip, when you have a gown like this and you want to check to make sure that the arm's eye is not too tight, what you really want to do is you want to make sure that you put your arms forward like so. I mean, only if you want to move your arms. If you have no problem keeping your arms here the entire time you're wearing an ensemble, then please, by all means, skip this step. But if you enjoy mobility as I do, limited as it may be by the general nature of historical clothing, put your arm forward. One can actually see that it's binding me right here, cutting into my arm really tightly. I then use tailor's soap to mark the respective spots needed for ease on both sides. This will no doubt give me asymmetrical markings to reflect my asymmetrical body, but I will end up applying to both sides the set of marks that offers the most room since I do not want one arm's eye shoulder strap to be visibly narrower than the other. I end up applying the roomier right hand side markings to the left and cut out both and then try the garment on again, only to discover that I need a bit more room still a little lower down in the arm's eye, which I mark and cut out. Okay, it's all good now. I can put my arms forward like this if I wanted to, I don't know, strangle someone, I suppose. It's interesting that it's a violent thought that comes to my head as an action I might have to commit. Six month project? Nay, nay. More like I can do math. It's definitely become a nine month project at this point. Our next exciting episode will find us half a planet away in the greater Seattle area, where we will work on assembling the skirts, binding the edges of the bodice, and who knows, maybe even bringing this damned project to completion, although probably not. Have any of my ramblings helped you in any of your creative endeavors? Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, until next time, stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of kitty zen.
Meow, meow. Meow, meow. Meow, meow. Psst, psst, psst. Kitty, kitty. Kitty, kitty. Meow, meow. <laughs> meow.